Mr. Field and how Mike feels. And this is the Oval Office. This is the big, I'm sure you've yeah. all been here many times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's a big deal, the Oval Office. John, go ahead, please. Mr. President, you mentioned the Coronavirus Task Force. Uh, yesterday, we're told that there were discussions of winding it down. Maybe by the beginning of June, you tweeted out this morning that it will continue indefinitely. What's the rationale for well, continuing? Well, it's had great success, and uh, Mike Pence has done a fantastic job. Whether it was on ventilators, when we started, we didn't have ventilators, and we got them built very quickly, and now we're giving them to other countries all over the world that are desperate for ventilators. Uh, uh, there's been no person in this whole country, in our whole country, that hasn't had a ventilator if they needed it. You probably saw that. Remember, at the beginning, it was really tough. It was. And uh, we got them built so fast. It was really an incredible mobilization, not since World War II has anything happened with not only ventilators, but other things else. Uh, testing is doing really well. Uh, and uh, the task force has done a great job. And I had a meeting yesterday. I had a meeting this morning, uh, probably even more importantly. And so we'll be leaving the task force indefinitely. We'll see. You know, at a certain point, that'll end like things end. But we'll be adding some people to the task force. And uh, there'll be uh, more in the neighborhood, probably, of uh, opening our country up, because our country has to get open again, and the people want it to be open. But we have to open it up safely. So we'll be adding two or three additional members to the task force. There may be one or two that will be less involved, that were more involved with the original uh, formation of the ventilator and the ventilator systems. But if they want to stay, they can, because they really did a fantastic job. So uh, at a certain point, we won't need the task force, but we're going to leave that. We're going to add a couple of people to it. And that will, again, be for the opening of our country. We're opening, you know, if you think about it, we're opening our country again. We're the most successful economy in history for any country anywhere in the world. And then they came. I was sitting right here, and they said, sir, we're going to have to close it. I said, close what? Basically, we're going to have to close our country. And just like you said, with the, uh, with the I, I said, uh, is it important that they not be together? It's not, it's not a question, right? It's not a question. You can't have the family together. It's so sad. So anyway, we have we did something that we did the right move. We saved millions of lives by doing what we did. But it's unbelievably tough for a country. And uh, most countries throughout the world did something similar. But this affected 182, 184 countries. And uh, it's a very sad thing, very sad thing. So we're keeping the task force uh, for a period of time. I look forward to when we can close the task force, because then the job will be essentially, hopefully, over, Mike, right? And you've done a fantastic job. Mr. President, can yes. you, you explain the change between what you said yesterday about winding down the task force and, and, and well, now saying you're going yeah. to it? Is yeah. it well, different from what you yeah. said yesterday? Well, I guess if you think we're always winding it down, but, you know, it's a question of what, what the end point it is. is but it, I think it is a change. Uh, a little bit. I thought we could wind it down sooner. But I had no idea how popular the task force is until actually yesterday. When I started talking about winding it down, I'd get calls from very respected people saying, I think it would be better to keep it going. It's done such a good job. It's a respected task force. It's uh, um, I, I, I knew it myself. I didn't know whether or not it was appreciated by the public, but it is appreciated by the public. I mean, you look at the job we've done on everything, on supplies, on everything. The gowns, the gloves, the, fa the masks. You saw yesterday the mask. We were at a factory yesterday, a great company, Honeywell. Mm -hmm. And in a period of four days, they took a big factory, essentially four days, a little longer, two weeks, but it was really most of the work done in four days. They took a big plant that did other things, and they converted it into masks. You have to see, it's, it's actually a complicated process, but they have unbelievable equipment. And they're doing millions of masks out of this factory. And that took place so quickly. And that was all because of the task force. I mean, all of this happened because of the people working within the administration. And something I didn't know, Mike, they take different layers of material and compress it, put it together. Because one layer is good for something, one layer is good for something else, one layer is good for very tiny particles. I mean, it's really, you think of it as a mask. They make a very good mint. This is really something that's very special. So um, so the task force will be around until 
we feel it's not necessary. But I will say that I learned yesterday, even after I spoke to Jeff, that the task force is something you knew. It's very respected. People said we should keep it going. So let's keep it going. And so we'll be doing that. But we'll be adding some people to it, Sir, actually. Who are some of the people you're thinking about? We have a whole list of people that want to be on, and we have a list of people that we want. And uh, what was their nobody is, I'll tell you, that I will say this, nobody's ever turned me down to be on that task force. It's very, nobody's turned me down for anything, to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. When we have a committee, like we had the various committees, the sports committee, the commissioners, everybody wants to be on everything we do, the business committees. It's never had anybody say, Jed, rather not be on that committee. You know, it's very important. So uh, we'll be announcing, I would say by Monday, we'll be announcing uh, two or three new members to the task force. Okay. Mr. President, on, on the issue of reopening, it seems little question that by beginning the reopening process and continuing it, there will likely be more cases of coronavirus, more deaths than there would have been had everything stayed shut down. Will the nation just have to accept the idea that by reopening, there will be more cases, there will be more deaths? So I call these people warriors, and I'm actually calling now, as you know, John, the nation warriors. You have to be warriors. We, we can't keep our country closed down for years, and we have to do something. And uh, hopefully that won't be the case, John, but it could very well be the case. Uh, you won't be locked in a house, and some people uh, should stay if you're over a certain age. I mean, you've seen that, right? Elderly people, or especially elderly people with Comorbidity. with a problem, yeah. where they have a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it attacks these people viciously. And I think they will be staying back, and we're strongly recommending that they do that. We're saying over 60, and especially over 60, if you have diabetes or heart problems or whatever problem you might have. So, uh, but we have to get our country open again. And you see it. Look, you cover it. People want to go back. You're going to have a problem if you don't do it. If you don't do it, you've got a very closer, big problem. How close are we to a permanent problem if we don't reopen the country? Well, I think people won't stand for it. Actually, I, I don't think our people will stand for it. Now, what I really believe you uh, people will be able to do is, at a certain age, they'll stay, stay back longer. Because, you know, this virus is going to disappear. It's a question of when. Will it come back in a small way? Will it come back in a, a fairly large way? But we know how to deal with it now much better. You know, nobody knew anything about it initially. Now we know we can put out fires. We can put out, I call them embers, if it's a small or if it's a fire or a hot spot, we can put it out. But we can't have our whole country out. We can't do it. Can't, the country won't take it. It won't stand it. It's not sustainable. And I think you're going to have a tremendous uh, transition, which is a third quarter thing. I think you're going to have a good fourth quarter. I think next year is going to be an incredible year economically. And with that being said, if somebody lost somebody, a, a parent or a wife or a husband or, you know, any brothers, sisters, if you lost someone, you could never make up for that by saying, well, you're going to have a great year next year economically. And so you can never do that. But I will say that from an economic standpoint, I think next year is going to be a very big year. There's tremendous demand. You see it with the stock market, where the stock market's at 24,000, and we went through the worst attack we've ever had on our country. This is really the worst attack we've ever had. This is worse than Pearl Harbor. This is worse than the World Trade Center. There's never been an attack like this. And it should have never happened. Could have been stopped at the source could have been stopped in China. It should have been stopped right at the source. And it wasn't. Okay. Mr. President, uh, 20 states have begun reopening without meeting the meeting criteria that your administration put out. Are you okay with that? I've given the leeway to the governors. If I see something wrong, we'll stop it. But I have given leeway to the governors to make that decision. Uh, you have some uh, governors, most of whom I have great respect for. They're working very hard. They're watching very closely. But we've given uh, leeway to the governors to make those decisions. And on um, unemployment, uh, there's some projections that show uh, unemployment in the month of April could be as high as 50 percent. Are you worried about that number? Are you also worried that Democrats Well, there's nothing. For there's no, no, I don't think they can. They're not blaming me. You know, it's very interesting. It's one thing. Nobody's blaming me for that. Uh, I built the greatest economy with a lot of great people that we've ever had. 
and I'm going to rebuild it again. We're going to have a great economy very soon, much sooner than people think. Much sooner now. We cut taxes and we do things that you have to do. If somebody comes along and raises taxes and does all of the nonsense that they're talking about, you'll have a crash like you've never seen before. But this was artificially induced. This was an artificially induced unemployment. This was where we said we're taking the greatest economy in the history of the world, because that's what it was. Most people in our country, ever, almost 160 million people, we were never close. And we had to turn it off. One day, it turned off. Nothing like that's ever happened before. But by doing that, we have saved millions of lives. Uh, but now we're going to make our, our comeback, and the comeback is going to be a very strong one. And I'll be meeting you in a little while, because, as you know, we have a Quick question Very good we go, because it's healthcare related. Uh, today is the deadline for the White House if it wants to modify its argument before the Supreme Court about invalidating Obamacare to do it. Will you continue with the plan to completely invalidate the ACA, or so what would we you want to do? Is, uh, is we want to? We're staying. Texas. We're not doing anything. In other words, we're staying with the group, with Texas and the group. Yeah. Uh, but just so you understand, Obamacare is a disaster, but we've run it very well. And we've made it barely acceptable. It was a disaster under President Obama, and it's very bad health care. What we want to do is terminate it and give great health care, and we'll have great health care, including pre-existing conditions, 100 percent pre-existing conditions. Now, we've already pretty much killed it because we got rid of the individual mandate. Now, in getting rid of the individual mandate, which was by far the most unpopular thing in Obamacare, that's where, for the privilege of paying a fee, you don't have to you don't have to buy health insurance at a ridiculous price for not good health insurance. It was a terrible thing. You were mandated to pay something in order not to pay, and we got rid of that. That's gone, and nobody thinks it's ever going to come back. But what we are doing is we want to terminate health care for under Obamacare because it's bad. And we're replacing it with a great health care at far less money, and it includes pre-existing conditions. There will never be a time when we don't have pre-existing conditions included. So, 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 so what I'm saying then, John, is we're going to replace Obamacare with great health care at a lesser price, and pre-existing conditions will be included. And you won't have the individual mandate, which was expensive and terrible and very unfair to everybody. And it was very unpopular. So, so Attorney General Barr's suggestion to pull back on invalidating the entire act and leave some of it in place, you're not going to go in that direction? No, I, I don't know about that suggestion. I think uh, I've spoken a lot about this to Bill Barr. And we're totally in lockstep with all of the many states that want to see much better health care. See, I don't view it as a termination. I view this as getting great health care. Because Obamacare, we run it really well. I had a decision to make. I said this yesterday. We took over Obamacare. We got rid of the individual mandate, which basically was the end of Obamacare. In a formal sense, it was really the end of Obamacare. And few people are challenging the fact that we can do that. So we got rid of the individual mandate. I had a decision to make. Do I want to have Obamacare run as well as it can run? Or do I want to have it run really badly so everybody could say Obamacare is terrible? Politically, I could do the other. I should do — let it run badly. But I can't do that because I'm president for the people. And we ran that much better than President Obama ran it, much better than the last administration ran it. SEMA and uh, Alex and everybody, and spent a lot of money in running it properly. It's still not good. It's still not good. But I had a decision. Do I want to run it great? Or do I run, want to run it really badly? Politically, I should have run it really badly, but I'm glad I made the decision to run it great. But running it great, it's still lousy health care. And we are going to do something that's going to be great health care, always including, always having, again, the individual mandate gone and pre existing conditions will be taken care of. So I'm glad you asked me that question. Mr. President, yesterday, You ended up not wearing one. Well, I actually did have one, no. I put a mask on. Yeah, I, I put — I had a mask on for a period of time. We didn't see you with a mask on. Well, I, I can't help it if you didn't see me. I mean, I had a mask on, but I didn't need it. 
And I asked uh, specifically the head of Honeywell, uh, should I wear a mask? And he said, well, you don't need one in this territory. And as you know, we're, we were far away from people, uh, from the people making the masks. They were making the masks. But I did put a mask on, and it was a Honeywell mask, actually. And I also had a 3M mask, and I had about four other masks. But I did have it on. I don't know if you saw it or not, but I had it on. How long did you have it on for? Not too long, but I had it on. I had it on back, backstage. But they said you didn't need it, so if I didn't need it, and by the way, if you notice, nobody else had it on that was in the group, so and they were the people. You saw the workers wearing them. The workers had them on, yeah. The workers were there, yeah, because they're working next to each other. Mr. Okay? President, what kind of message does it send that you're surrounded by nurses who are not doing social distancing, who are not wearing masks? What kind of a message? Well, I can't help that. I mean, look, I'm trying to be nice. I'm signing a bill, and you criticize us. Look, here's the story. There's nothing I can do to satisfy the media, the Democrats, or the fake news. And I understand that. We did the greatest job mobilization in history with the ventilators. And I don't think there was a story what a great job we did. Now we're helping Germany and we're helping many other countries, uh, France, Spain, yes. and, and Italy, by the way, and Nigeria, sending 250 to Nigeria ventilators. And two months ago, we didn't have any ventilators for ourselves. We were, we, the cupboards were bare, right, Deborah? They were bare. People have no idea. There's not a thing I can do to satisfy the fake news, and there's not a thing I can do to satisfy Democrats. I watch this phony Chuck Schumer. Everyone in New York knows he's a total phony. He brought nothing back to New York except salt. You know what salt is? Bad tax policy. He brought salt back. He didn't even fight it. I watched him the other night on a show. And all he could talk about was testing, testing, testing. And yet I showed a chart yesterday where our testing is far superior to anybody else's testing. And then the other thing is very interesting. Because we did so much more testing, we have more cases. If I did little testing, we'd have practically no cases. So the headline was, we have more cases than anyone else. Well, China has more cases than us and other big countries. You know, you're talking about big countries but they don't want to choose, they don't want to use that. The fact is, we've done better testing, more testing. In fact, we've done, as of two days ago, more testing than the entire world together. You would add every country, every country together, we've done substantially more testing than the entire world together. And all I get is, oh, we have more cases. You understand that. We have more cases because we do more testing. If I don't do testing, we don't have any cases. So, as I do more testing, they say, but you have more cases. They're very smart, but they're very devious people. And in many cases, very bad people. And in some cases, very good ones. There's a couple of good ones here. Can we ask uh, the young man who was sleeping on the floor behind you a question? Uh, up until recently, we've heard a lot of stories of hardships on the front line, owing to a shortage of PPE, masks, that sort of thing. Can you tell us, did it get bad? Uh, where you were and what's the situation now compared to what it was? Sure, there's always a lag time between what happens in real time uh, versus when you guys get it and, and, and run it, you know. So the PPE, the ventilator situation, yes, it got to a point where it was getting uh, bad, but manufacturing ramped up. And I think those are two things that we knew we would take care of as a country. The third thing that we can't manufacture, and I've talked about this before, is uh, a doctor or a nurse or you know essential personnel we can't just manufacture them so ultimately that ended up being the weakest point mm -hmm. for us on the front lines um, we had the pp we had the ventilators in time but we just didn't have enough people we couldn't get them there fast enough and one of the things we did is we sent in the military doctors and nurses and i think most of you have seen them and some of you have worked with them but they did a fantastic job john we had a lot of the military like we took the comfort because they didn't need the ship and we took the comfort, and we took the doctors and nurses, and we sent them all over New York and New Jersey. We took doctors and nurses out of the convention center, the Javits Convention Center, and many of them went throughout New York. So we did a job. And we weren't even supposed to have doctors in the convention center, but we ended up putting them. So we had a lot of, uh, because it's true, what you're saying is right. The man and woman power uh, was one of the toughest things. Mr. Luke, are you are you seeing now that the, the supplies are what they need to be? Yeah. Yes. yes. 
I think it's sporadic. Yes. If I talk to my colleagues around the country, certainly there are pockets of areas where PPE is not ideal, but this is an unprecedented time. And the infection control measures that we learned uh, back when we went to school, one gown, one mask for one patient a day or per time, this is a different time. And I, I've been reusing my N95 mask for a few weeks now. I just broke out a new one to come here just in case I needed to wear it. To answer your question earlier, we're all COVID-19 free. We were all tested. Yes. So we're, we're not socially distancing, but we're all negative. And we wouldn't do anything to harm our present, obviously. Um, Everybody's we, been tested, yeah. Yeah, we were all tested. I hope the test works, right? <laughs> so we were all tested. We're all negative. And so that's why we're not socially distancing and um, why we're not wearing masks. Um, uh, certainly, and I've had several tests throughout this whole COVID-19 crisis. I practice in New Orleans at a community health center. My youngest mm -hmm. patient has been four days old, a four-day-old infant. Um, and uh, so PPE has been sporadic, uh, but it's been manageable, and we do what we have to do. We're nurses, and we learn to adapt and do whatever the best thing that we can do for our patients to get the job done and get the care provided, and that's what we're going to continue to do as COVID-19 continues. Sporadic for you, but not sporadic for a lot of other people. Oh, no, I agree, Mr. President. Because Absolutely. I've heard the opposite. I've yeah. heard that they are loaded up with with uh, gowns now and you know initially we had nothing we had empty cupboards we had empty shelves we had nothing because it wasn't put there by the last administration and uh, i've heard that we have uh, i just saw it yesterday where they're making millions of masks a month in a factory from you know in that case it was arizona it's great we have other factories being built now for masks and uh, for the most part, I, I have, I mean, that was fine, but I've heard we have uh, tremendous supply to almost all places. Tremendous supply to a point where we're going to start uh, having some of our supply go to other countries which need it very badly. How did you find that? Do you find a good supply? Huh? I, I found yeah. that we had what we needed. Good. We had to change Thank the you. way we did things. But yeah. Yeah. You'll end up being a star. And, and Mr. President, I just want to add one thing, too. Um, you know, in, in my, I'm a nursing supervisor where I work at, and one of the blessings I have is my director, my assistant director, his name is Dennis Hunter. Um, he said, you know what? You guys take care of nursing. We'll make sure we have the supply. Mm -hmm. When we all talk about the fears, it makes it so much worse for us nurses to work. We're seeing the reality of it, and but to hear it on constantly, there's not enough, there's not enough, in reality, I'm not seeing it. I'm in a hot zone right now. I'm in South New Jersey. Right? We're very close to New York. And so you don't see now. that when you hear the stories. You know, know why? Because they're know? fake news. That's why. <laughs> I, have to say I really it. appreciate you saying that. It's so nice that you stepped up, because they're fake news. No, when I when I took over, it's different. Now I will say this: there was a period of time, but between uh, Russia, 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 and all the stuff that these characters put us through. It's not so easy. And despite that, I've done more than any other president in history in the first three years as president. And you can look at that from any way you want to look at it, from rebuilding the military to cutting taxes to getting rid of regulations at a level that nobody's ever come close to, uh, to saving your Second Amendment, which is under siege, by the way. So, you know, we've done. But I really appreciate your statement. That was really beautiful. And we did. I mean, I remember at the beginning of this crisis that uh, you all are encouraging right. people not, enough, not to wear them in order to have it for you're them. You're right, but so that was, was the, not enough at the beginning. You're right, Jeff. And the reason that we did such a good job is because we were able, now we have factories all over doing masks and building our own masks and doing them because a lot of countries, I don't want to be specific, but they sent us masks which were total garbage and they were defective. And they sent us other equipment which was defective. Mm -hmm. And so now we're building our own masks. We're doing our own masks. We're making them by the millions. And Honeywell in Arizona yesterday was a case in point. And that was some scene. I've never seen anything like it. And I didn't realize as they put different layers and then they put it together and each layer has a different function. I mean, you know, it's not just like taking a thing and wrapping it as we said perhaps you can do in certain conditions, but certainly not inside of a hospital. But. Uh, no, we, uh, we ended up, we had an empty cupboard, and now we have full cupboards. And we have ventilators, and we have tremendous testing. 
And we're doing the antibodies very shortly, as you probably know. That's going to also I mean, you know, there are a lot of people that don't believe in such big testing, Deborah. I mean, you know, you have some people that want to test everything, 15 different ways. Mostly that's the media, because they know, you know, certain things can't be done. But we have tremendous testing right now. When you see that chart, I don't have it with me now. I guess they have it someplace in the room. But when you see the chart that I put up yesterday as I was interviewed by one of your friends on ABC, um, that chart says it better than anything I can say. You saw the line going. We're like a rocket ship. Everyone else is down here in testing. And then all they do is complain about the testing. So look, you get used to that. But I really appreciate the fact that uh, what you said. And we do have, we have great, and not only do we have great equipment, but we have the, the, the quality of what we have is far better than anything that we're getting. Because we see what comes in. The quality of the gowns, the quality of the masks, uh, we have, as of today, we got one billion gloves. Gloves. One billion. Who ever heard of such a thing? At the beginning, we had none. You know, when this all started, we had none. It's one of the greatest mobilizations. It's a war, and it's one of the greatest mobilizations. So it's been, it's been very successful. Mr. President, one more, one more question about reopening. Uh, the initial forecast showed that the de real decline in the infection curve would be about June the 1st. Yeah. Latest forecast to push that now back to August. And I'm wondering what the ramifications might be for certain reopenings, particularly schools, which begin to go back near the beginning of August. I, I mean, I can, I'll just address one part of that. The school should open. The one thing you should be careful of is when instructors are over 60, especially if they have a problem. That you should be careful. But the school should definitely open, in my opinion. Could you answer the other part, Deborah? So the, I think you're referring to the model that looks at mortality. Did we uh, talked about this. Yeah. And the mortality is very variable. That model has gone from 60,000 now to 134,000. Obviously, we track mortality very closely. You can see the rate of new hospitalizations has gone dramatically down. And so we're following that and mortality very closely. Mm -hmm. um, and so. We all know about models, and that's why we follow the data metro by metro. And you know, we have represented here um, New Orleans that has moved through a very large peak and has come down the other side. Same with Detroit. We continue to watch Chicago very carefully. We know that both Mass both Boston and Philadelphia are still working through a very difficult time. So. The country has moved as individuals, and what we are so proud about is how much the governors are using testing in a focused way. So they're not just diagnosing the individuals that have come to the hospital with symptoms. They're proactively going out and testing in nursing homes and prisons and testing everybody when they see one case in a meatpacking plant. And this is really allowing us insight, and we really appreciate the media call calling out the asymptomatic spread, because we've been talking about it for two months, but now finally it's really getting picked up that there is asymptomatic spread, and that's why governors using that strategic testing to ensure that the most vulnerable, those in disadvantaged areas of the cities, in multi-generational households, those in, in group housing, those in nursing homes, those in prisons, are really, they're aggressively doing what we call surveillance and surveillance testing, and I think we've just been very proud to watch the governors pick up on the federal guidelines that called that out as a very key point. Do you, do you think we'll be in a place in August where schools, at least in some states, will be able to reopen? Well, again, it's a county by county, state by state decision, and that's how we're collecting data, and we're hoping, and we are asking all of the states to have a very, very great data system so that every community member can see what's happening in their community, both with hospitalizations and testing, and unfortunately, any mortality. So these decisions can be continuously updated. And we're seeing that. We're seeing much better sites at the state and county level to really inform the public in a very clear way. So Mr. President, you say you'd like to see schools open and just have people or teachers who are in the age group not go in or be more careful? I would like to see schools open wherever possible, which I think is in much of the country, most of the country. No, I, I would say that until uh, everything is perfect, I think that the teachers that are a certain age, perhaps you say over 60, especially if they have a problem with heart or uh, diabetes or any one of a number of things, I think that they should not be teaching school for a while. 
and everybody would understand that fully. That we understand. But other than that, you see how well children seem to do. It's incredible. We realize how strong children are, right? It's Their immune system is maybe a little bit different. Maybe it's just a little bit stronger. Or maybe it's a lot stronger, right? Could be a lot stronger. Uh, we've learned a lot by watching this monster. Uh, thank you very much. Right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. See, you in about, see you in about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.